Good morning, I'm Seth Morley, the pastor of West Salem Christian Church. I want to welcome you to our worship service this morning. I want to read from Psalm 100 this morning as we begin. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And we're here this morning to worship him for all of those things, for his goodness, his faithfulness, and all of the wonderful things that he is and continues to bring into our lives through Jesus every day. So let's worship him together this morning. breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breath. Take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nation with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free. that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, 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 yeah. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Thank you. 
Good morning once again. I'm Larry Garrett, an elder at West Salem Christian Church. Welcome to our online worship service for October 18th. This is our prayer time. Our Lord and Savior loves humanity very much. Greater love hath no man than he who lays down his life for his friends. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying about what was to happen to him, Scripture says that his sweat was like drops of blood. This extremely rare condition is called hematidrosis, and according to medical literature, can happen when someone is feeling intense fear or stress. Why would Jesus feel such stress? Because he was about to suffer an agonizing death, be weighted down with the sin of all mankind, and be separated from God the Father as this holy transaction took place. Add to that, in my opinion, the stress of temptation to make the choice not to suffer and die. Jesus had a will and a choice as indicated by his prayer, Father, if it be thy will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine. You know, there's only one name under heaven that provides salvation. It's Jesus Christ. Believe on him and thou shalt be saved. Belief means action. So take that step today, then come and be baptized in his name. Shall we pray? 
O merciful Father, thank you for your bountiful mercy upon sinful mankind. What marvelous grace and patience you continue to show to us. Lord Jesus, we give you grateful thanks for loving us while we were still your enemies. Your amazing choice to go to the cross, suffer and die at the hands of those you created is truly love beyond measure. When we consider ourselves, we cry out like Isaiah, we are people with unclean lips. We confess to you how easy it is for us to make choices outside your will, to think of ourselves before others, to covet, to be jealous, to put other gods before you. Forgive us, O Lord, and create in us new hearts. Thank you for your holy word, for it has led us to salvation and we continue to pray that your word will convict and save those with ears to hear. We also continue to lift each other up as members of West Salem Christian Church, praying for perseverance in the faith during moments of attack, deliverance from evil, patience and a soft voice when dealing with anger and pain, strength and the choice to obey when crossroads are reached. Above all, may you continue to minister to this fallen world through us. Whatever is accomplished, glory and thanksgiving go to you, our mighty God. During this time of prayer, as specific names and faces cross our thoughts, we pray for their needs, be it salvation, healing from illness, comfort in loss, faith in times of fear, whatever the need, Father, we know that you will provide just the right solution and at just the right time, in the same way that you provided the answer to physical and spiritual death. We pray for our nation and its spiritual life. We join with the millions of other Christians in praying for a revival and a return to you. We thank you too for all the pastors who dedicate themselves to you and their flocks in ministry as we celebrate Pastor Appreciation Month. In particular, we lift up Seth and his family for strength, unity, and blessing as they minister here with us. And Father, prepare now the hearts and minds of those who are about to hear your word. Empower change, salvation, and growth within us, we humbly pray. For it is in Jesus' name, amen. This is the last week of our series looking at the life of Gideon. Gideon's story is in the Old Testament book of Judges because he was one of the people known as the judge of the nation of Israel. These were basically just people who were chosen to lead the nation. And the judges of the nation of Israel were chosen by God, whether they asked for the job or not. And as we saw with Samson when we looked through his life a few months ago, and as we are beginning to see with Gideon, even if they're chosen by God, human leaders are not perfect. Sometimes that can be a painful lesson for us to learn. Parents are not perfect. Teachers are not perfect. Politicians are not perfect. Police, firefighters, friends, spouses, pastors, none of them. Nobody is perfect. And that's why it's so important for us to read and study God's word so that we know what it says. Because some of the most terrible tragedies in history are because someone or a group of people twisted scripture to use it to manipulate people. And people were deceived because they didn't know the Bible well enough to be able to recognize and reject lies that almost sounded like the truth. And that's sort of where the Israelite people have been, just before we see Gideon show up on the scene here. They've been worshiping the false gods and idols of their enemies. These false gods probably seemed fine. I mean, 
what could it hurt? You know, I'll just make some sacrifices to Baal or Asherah. If it meant that, you know, you might get a better crop or that your kids would be healthy or you'd have more kids. But God knew that it wasn't about crops or kids. This was a heart issue. And we're going to see that heart issue pop up again here at the end of Gideon's story. We start to see a pattern in Gideon's life. It seems like in one situation, he'll make a really good, wise, thoughtful decision. And then he'll find some way to turn around and follow that up with a really bad decision. In the last part of the story, we saw that the Ephraimites had gotten all mad at Gideon because they weren't invited to the battle. But then he's able to use humility to diffuse that situation. But then he goes on and he meets the people of Succoth and Peniel, and when both of those cities refuse to give his starving men bread, he threatens Succoth that he will tear their flesh with desert thorns. And he tells the men of Peniel that he will tear down their city's tower. Well, today we're going to see what Gideon does. Does he cool down? Does he show mercy to these cities? Or does he follow through on his threats? Let's pick up on Jud in Judges 8, uh, verse 10 to see how it plays out. Now Ziba and Zalmunna were in Karkor with a force of about 15,000 men, all that were left of the armies of the eastern peoples. 120,000 swordsmen had fallen. Gideon went up by the route of the nomads east of Noba and Jugbeha and attacking or attacked the unsuspecting army. Ziba and Zalmunna, the two kings of Midian, fled, but he pursued them and captured them, routing their entire army. Gideon, son of Joash, then returned from the battle by the pass of Herez. Okay, moment of truth here. Gideon has routed his enemies. He's victorious. He's not in the heat of battle anymore. And he's captured the two kings of Midian. He's now ready to return home. But he chooses to take a path home that he knows will lead him back into conflict. The, this path of Herez is going to lead him back through Succoth and Peniel. So let's see what happens. He caught a young man of Succoth and questioned him, and the young man wrote down for him the names of the 77 officials of Succoth, the elders of the town. Then Gideon came and said to the men of Succoth, Here are Ziba and Zalmunna, about whom you taunted me by saying, Do you already have the hands of Ziba and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your exhausted men? He took the elders of the town and taught the men of Succoth a lesson by punishing them with desert thorns and briars. He also pulled down the tower of Peniel and killed the men of the town. Okay, hold on a second, Gideon. Not only does he not calm down or show mercy to these cities, he actually ramps up the anger and violence and does way more than what he threatened to do. Gideon demonstrates for us here we need to deal with our anger so that we don't end up dealing out our anger. Have you ever been in a situation where you had time to think about something that had upset you? And instead of calming down and getting over it, you just kept stewing on it and getting more and more angry the more you thought about it. I've definitely done that over and over again. And anger, especially over how someone has wronged us, is like an infection. The longer we let it go untreated, the more it spreads and the more damage that it does. There's a reason that Paul says in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Because anger is a great place for the devil to get a foothold. A patch of anger in our lives is a perfect place for him to plant seeds of doubt and hatred and especially selfishness. Think about it. When we're angry, we are really just focused on ourselves and how we feel. And what's one of Satan's oldest tricks? To use our selfishness against us and to distract us from God. In the Garden of Eden, Satan made it all about Eve and not God. Basically, he told her, oh, eating the forbidden fruit isn't going to kill you. You can't trust God anyway. He's just being selfish. He doesn't want you to be able to do what you want to do. When Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness... He made it all about Jesus' humanity. Turn these stones into bread. Feed yourself. Throw yourself off the top of the temple and let those angels save you. Exalt yourself. Bow down and worship me and gain the whole world. Give in to your selfish desire. 
And Satan's tactics haven't changed. He wants to make it about us and distract us from being focused on God. What someone did to us can cause anger. What Jesus has done for us can bring peace. It's always hard as a pastor to know if you're really communicating effectively. And one thing I always want to make sure of is that I try to give real life practical ways of how we can put God's work, word into practice in our lives. And most times that comes through learning and growing myself. And one way I have directly learned from Gideon's story is in handling frustrations or disagreements in my marriage. Oftentimes, when my wife, Christy, does something that frustrates me, it's not the first time. There are very few things she does that upset me. So when she does those things, the reaction I want to have is, I've told her before that I don't like that. She should know. I shouldn't have to explain it to her again. And when I do that, I'm just focusing on me and how I feel. And she has no idea what's going on. And it's not fair because I haven't told her how I'm feeling, but I'm holding it against her. And that lack of communication on my part lets me just sit and stew and, on my frustration. Gideon got angry and he threatened to injure people and destroy property. But later when he came back, he had let his anger grow and he'd done nothing to deal with it. So, he not only did what he threatened to do, he killed all the men of the town. Gideon is way out of bounds here, and we can find ourselves in similar predicaments. In my marriage, when I stop and realize that I'm upset because I'm totally focused on me, I have to first then take that frustration to God. And I have to ask him to help me to see it from my wife's perspective and from his perspective. And then I have to go to her and try to explain to her how I feel about what happened. And if we discuss how each of us saw the situation and what we can do to keep from miscommunicating again, then we're able to put the focus on us and on Jesus and not on our individual selves. And that's what Gideon missed. He couldn't get his focus on the miraculous things that God had done for him because he was too focused on what these other people had done to him. And like I said, selfishness and anger are like an infection and infections spread. So people around Gideon are in danger too. Let's keep reading in Judges 8, 18 through 21. Then he asked Ziba and Zalmunna, what kind of men did you kill at Tabor? Men like you, they answered, each one with the bearing of a prince. Gideon replied, those were my brothers, the sons of my own mother. As surely as the Lord lives, if you had spared their lives, I would not kill you. Turning to Jether, his oldest son, he said, kill them. But Jether did not draw his sword because he was only a boy and he was afraid. Ziba and Zalmunna said, come, do it yourself. As is the man, so is his strength. So Gideon stepped forward and killed them and took the ornaments off their camel's necks. This is so sad. Gideon had initially decided to take these enemy kings captive, but now in his rage, he kills them. Once again, he finds a way to follow up a good decision with a bad one. And Gideon has made a major turn here. He's definitely taken his eyes off of what God has done for him. And all he can see is what these men did to him. Remember last week, we read Romans 12, 19. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Well, we see a perfect example here of why it's a good idea to let God avenge things in our life and not take it upon ourselves. I'm sure that Gideon thought that it would make him feel better and just be better for everybody and maybe send a message to his other enemies if he killed these two men. But we'll, really, we see it just dragged more people into trouble. Gideon even tries to get his young son involved in the execution of these men. Gideon's bad decision seem to be getting worse and more costly as we go here. And now the whole nation has a decision to make. For the nation of Israel, everything has changed. They're no longer under the thumb of their enemies. Uh, they've been rescued by the one true God. And now they have to learn how to live as free people. In Luke 16, 10, Jesus says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. 
The Israelites had not done very well with the little freedom that they had before. They had fallen into worshiping the false gods and idols of their enemies, and just like they couldn't be trusted with very little freedom, it seems like they can't be trusted with more freedom either. As we pick up in Judges 8, verse 22, we see what they want. The Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. There are probably none of us, unless we're under the age of five, who have not seen, heard, or experienced the great disagreement and divide in our political system over the last few months. The closer we get to the election, the more divided, heated, and angry people seem to be. The process of our people, our country choosing someone to lead our country, is sometimes not a very peaceful process. But the Israelites weren't having that problem in this case. They were in total agreement. They wanted Gideon to lead them. But Gideon shows us when God is leading us, we have to stay in our lane. Here he goes again, ping-ponging back and forth between wisdom and foolishness. Just after acting out of anger and revenge, Gideon shows some great wisdom and restraint here. It's always nice to have people tell you that they appreciate you. We all like to be affirmed and told that we're doing a good job or that we're valuable. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's easy to start to think that then we need to take on way more responsibility than what we really should. Ambition is great. Setting high standards and goals is, is great, but we also have to know what we're equipped for and what God has really called us to do and not go beyond that. My sister is definitely the smart child in our family. She's always been strong in math and science, and so she was a biology major in college, and she looked at the options of what to do with a biology degree and decided that teaching would be a good choice. So after graduating uh, from college, she did a year of student teaching and got her teaching credential. She was now finished with school, something that she had always excelled at, and was now moving into her career. She started out uh, by teaching math and science to seventh graders for three years, and then ultimately taught one year of biology and marine biology to high schoolers. She had some frustrations and struggles like any new teacher, but she did her best to settle in. After four years, as she assessed her situation, she began to notice things in herself, things that she had seen before in other teachers. In her words, I was becoming a grumpy teacher who would probably just end up putting in my time so that I could retire. And that's not who I wanted to be. So she decided to take a year off. And in that year, someone in her church who knew that she taught science told her she should check out a company that they thought was sciencey. And that company uh, was in the biomedical field, and she actually has worked now for that company for over a decade. And she's able to use her science, math, and teaching abilities, but in a setting that's much better suited to her being successful. And it takes a lot of strength, wisdom, and honest, honesty to not just do the easiest thing. So the easiest thing for her would have been to just stay in teaching and keep going. But the best thing for her was to say no to that option and to follow God's leading to an opportunity that, was better, that she was better equipped for. And for Gideon, the easiest thing would have been for him to accept what all of his countrymen were pushing for and to rule over them. But he had the wisdom and the strength to say, I will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Good job. Good decision, Gideon. Way to go. But wait, this could be bad news. According to his pattern here, Gideon is due for another bad decision. And we see it the very next sentence in this passage. Let's pick up in Judges 8, 24. And he said, I do have one request that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment, and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels, not counting the ornaments and pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains that were on their camels' necks. 
Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. (sighs) He did it again. This is kind of a weird part of the story, but it shows us something extremely important. Gideon was wise in understanding that ruling as king was not his role, but now he tries to essentially take a much more important role. And his mistake here is a reminder to us. When we come to God, we do it on his terms. The word ephod, which is used in this passage, can have different meanings, but the most common biblical usage is to describe a garment worn by the high priest of Israel. Most often when we see depictions of the ephod, it's mostly focused on the breastplate, but it's actually made up of shoulder pieces and the breastplate and then a waistband. The original ephod described in the book of Exodus was made of uh, precious materials and linen. Other ephods were made of metal, but the most important aspect of the ephod to the Israelites was that it was a priestly garment. It was supposed to be worn by the high priest as part of his role as the people's representative before God. And God also made it clear that when the high priest was wearing the ephod, he bore the means for making decisions for the Israelites. A few hundred years before this, after Moses had died, Joshua had led the people into the promised land. And when they divided up the promised land between the tribes of Israel, Joshua placed the tabernacle, the place of worship, in a city called Shiloh. This made Shiloh the center of worship for the Israelite people and the place where the high priest offered sacrifices. But this passage tells us that Gideon has made his own ephod. Not only that, he didn't use it for its intended purpose. He hung it up in his own town, which was a two-day journey from where the tabernacle was. I think Gideon's motivation was to hear from God and to worship him, but he ended up creating a replacement for God. The people worshiped an object instead of making God the object of their worship. Gideon had tried to take a shortcut and he ended up misleading himself and all the people around him. And he had done great things for God, but he didn't finish strong. And it's a huge warning for us today. If we want to finish strong, we can't take shortcuts. When maybe God's plan is taking longer than what we want, we have to remain faithful to his leading and his timing and not push too hard. When there are demands on our time, we can't lower God on our priority list. When living according to his word means that we're out of step with the people or the culture around us, we can't compromise on his truth. And look, I'm not trying to be legalistic here, but when it comes to what people, even ourselves, think, feel, or want, and Compare that to what God says, we have to choose God. Last year, because of a generous gift, my family and I got to go to Hawaii for the first time. And we flew from Portland to San Francisco, changed planes, and then we're on to Honolulu. But in San Francisco, we were delayed because the radar system on our plane wasn't working right. And when you're flying to a little island in the middle of a massive ocean, you want to make sure you know where you're going. And in a plane, if you're off target, By just one degree, you get off target by one mile for every 60 miles that you fly. That means if we were off by one degree from San Francisco to Honolulu, we would have missed Hawaii by about 43 miles. And for us in life, sometimes taking a shortcut, it can seem to bring short-term results. But in the long run, we're going to be way off course. So as we look back at the story of Gideon, we can see some great victories and also some failures. And all of our lives will be like that. And that's why the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness that we find in Jesus is such a great gift. But let's learn from Gideon that while we're not going to be perfect, we can focus on what God has done for us through Jesus. We can stay focused on what he's called us to do. We can do things his way and his timing on his terms. And as he leads us, we can finish strong. Let's pray. God, we want to finish strong. We don't want to kind of be zigzagging all over the place like Gideon was, making good decisions followed by really bad ones. And we know we're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. But we want to be as true to you as we can. So help us to 
to not expect perfection from ourselves, but to lean on the perfection of Jesus and allow him to lead us and to shape our lives so that we can deal with the things in our lives and move forward so that we can stay focused on you, stay in our lane, stay true to the calling that you have put in our lives. Help us to be patient, to not take shortcuts and and run ahead of you, but to wait for your timing and your leading because we know it's going to be right. And we just pray that you would help us to take the time to put you in the place in our lives that you need to be right at the center on the throne of our lives so that we can finish strong, that we won't get off course. We won't be off by one degree or 10 degrees, but we're going to be pointed straight toward you so that when we get to the end of this life, we can hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. We thank you for your love for us, for the great things that you have ahead in our lives and what you're going to do through us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
This is our time of communion, so if you have bread or juice or other things to remember communion with, this would be the time to gather them. In the story of Gideon today, we talked about an ephod, and that the ephod was something worn by the high priest. And the high priest is mostly associated with the worship of God in the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament. But interestingly, the book where the term high priest is used the most is in the New Testament. In the book of Hebrews, Paul uses that term 18 times because the book of Hebrews was written to Hebrews. And he knew the idea of a high priest would mean something to a Jewish audience. He spends a lot of the book making the case for Jesus being our great high priest, not only for Hebrews, but for all of us who accept him. Because just as the high priest would enter the presence of God to make sacrifices for the forgiveness of the Jewish people, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father and brings forgiveness for us. In Hebrews 4, 14, Paul writes, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And so we can approach the table of communion today with confidence, knowing that in Jesus, our high priest, we will find mercy and grace because he was our sacrifice. So let's take the bread this morning to remember the sacrifice of his body that was broken for us. And let's take the juice to remember his blood that was poured out. Let's pray together. Father, such a great sacrifice was paid by Jesus. His life, his body, his blood laid down, given for us. And thank you that He didn't just die. He didn't just go to the grave, but he conquered death and sin. And he ascended to heaven, that he's seated at your right hand, that he speaks on our behalf, that our rags are washed pure white in his blood because of the sacrifice he made so that we can have forgiveness and mercy and grace. And so we come confidently before you, knowing that we have made mistakes, that we have sinned but that we have forgiveness that comes through Jesus. And that's such an amazing gift. We thank you for that. We thank you for the opportunity to remember what it cost to bring that forgiveness. Help us never to forget. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. This is our time of giving. With it being fall, it made me think about harvest. And when I thought about harvest, I thought about a man in our church named Cody who lives and works on a hazelnut farm, or as we call them in Oregon, filberts. And when I thought of Cody, I thought about all the work that he does year round from dawn till dark, a lot of the time preparing and planting and fertilizing and and nurturing these trees so that in the fall, the hazelnuts can be harvested and sent off to make all sorts of products that all sorts of people can enjoy. And it made me think about what it's like to give to God. And a lot of giving is a routine. And and for those of us who who tithe and who make giving a regular part of our lives, it's it's something that we do year round, just all the time, because we want to consistently give to God and make that a part of our lives. 
But that giving isn't just routine. It isn't just run of the mill because what we're producing through that giving is important. And where that giving goes is going to make a huge difference because we're not only giving to a good cause, we're giving to a God who can take those gifts and do amazing, miraculous things like he did with taking Gideon's army of 300 and allowing them to almost effortlessly defeat an army of thousands upon thousands. And it reminded me of a quote as we give. A lot of times we're giving to the future. We're making an investment. We're planting a seed that we don't know how God is going to use, but somewhere down the road, God is going to take that gift and do something for his glory and for the benefit of someone else through that. And there's a quote that's quoted in all sorts of different ways by different people, but the original quote comes from an Elton True Blood book, and it says, A man has made at least a start on discovering the meaning of human life when he plants shade trees under which he knows full well he will never sit. And it's part of the excitement and the joy of giving is knowing that we're giving a gift to God and we don't know how he's going to use that, but we know it's going to be good. We know it's going to be for his glory. And so I want to encourage you to give this morning. If you'd like to click on the giving tab, you can uh, give through Tithely there on the streaming uh, screen if you're watching this live stream. If uh, you're on YouTube, you can go to our website and give uh, through there, westsalem.church. And if you want to get the Tithely app on your phone, T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y, and you can choose West Salem Christian Church as your church on there and, and give digitally that way. Thank you again for joining us for worship. I want to invite you back next week. We'll be back here online at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. We are meeting in the church building now because of the weather and the seasonal change. We'll keep doing that as long as we can. We never know how uh, quarantine mandates and things will be adjusted, but uh, for the time being, we'll be meeting inside, but we will always continue to be online as well, 10.30 a.m. Sunday morning. So I invite you back next time. Let's pray as we get ready to sing our final song and to close the service this morning. Father, we thank you for being so faithful to us that we can uh, praise you for who you are because you never change. We change, we make mistakes, we have ups and downs, but you are consistent and trustworthy and faithful and we thank you for that. And we pray that you'd help that to be a quality of us too as we follow you, that we would faithfully step out and, and do what you ask us to do and follow you closely because we know that you have great things you want to accomplish for your kingdom through our lives. And we want to be your people called according to your purpose. So lead us this week, watch over us and bring us back safely next time. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. It's your breath in our lungs, 
Though we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. And great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only and great 